Good evening. It is a great honor to introduce this year's Kitts Lecture in honor of Father Richard Clifford. Dr. Michael J. Gorman holds the Raymond E. Brown Chair in Biblical Studies and Theology at St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore, Maryland. Since 1991, he has taught at St. Mary's, serving as the Dean of St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute for 17 years. He has also been a, profess a visiting professor at Duke University Divinity School, at Grand Seminar Notre Dame de l'Esperance in Cameroon, Regent College in Vancouver, and several other places. Boston is familiar territory for Professor Gorman, having received his BA in French from Gordon College on the North Shore. He holds the MDiv and PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. A member of the Society of Jesus, I'm sorry, that was a, that was a Freudian slip. Let me try that again. A member of the Society for New Testament Studies. I'll repeat that, a member of the Society for, his wife Nancy, I think, would take exception to his being a A member of the Society for New Testament Studies and the Society of Biblical Literature, Professor Gorman is on the editorial board of the Journal for the Study of Paul and His Letters. The author of more than a dozen books and numerous articles, Professor Gorman's work includes several books on Paul, uh, some of which are used in our courses to this day, including last Monday I, teamed, or I taught for uh, Matt Monig and was happy to see that we're reading a book called Reading Paul, so the royalties keep, uh, the shekels keep uh, coming in. He's written books on Revelation, the Gospel of John, and on Atonement. Also volumes on biblical interpretation and on topics in Christian ethics. You will find some of these publications available for purchase at the bookstore table at the entrance, and I'd really encourage you to take a look and uh, perhaps buy one or, or more. A United Methodist layperson, Professor Gorman is a frequent lecturer in churches and institutions of higher education of many traditions in the US and abroad. The Reverend Dr. Mark Gorman, the oldest of the Gorman's three adult children, is a Methodist pastor and theologian. Gorman the Elder and Gorman the Younger occasionally team teach at St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute. Professor Gorman sees himself as an active participant in what it means to be the church. In an interview, he said, and I quote, I have really tried to practice what I preach as much as I can. I don't want to be just someone who thinks and writes and does exegesis and teaches classes, but someone who shows up to put that into practice in the community, end quote. A teacher, theological writer, scholar, and committed Christian, please join me in welcoming our 2019 Kitts Lecture, Dr. Michael Gorman. Thank you so much, uh, Father Stegman. Once in a while, uh, walking around the seminary, the seminarian will say, how are you doing today, Father? And then they'll, they'll st I'm obviously a father, but not that kind of father. They'll say, how are you doing today, Father? Oh, wait a minute, I mean doctor. But I've, so I feel promoted when that happens, but I've never been promoted to the status of Jesuit before <laughs> this introduction. So I'll, I'll take that as honorary, probably. Uh, so thank you, I'll, I'll take the honor. It's a great privilege to be here. Uh, Father Stegman drove us around the campus a, a bit. It's, it's a gorgeous campus here at uh, Boston College. And it's an honor to honor uh, Father Richard Clifford, who actually we've just met for the first time, although we know each other from a distance. I was privileged to contribute to the Paulist Biblical Commentary, which Father Stegman and Father Clifford and my good friend Father Ron Witherup and others edited, so we have connections, but they haven't been personal till tonight, so I'm, I'm really honored to be here, and I think it's wonderful that you have this lecture. A slight uh, story that I, di I didn't know would I'd have to tell or should tell, the Kitts family have a daughter named Anne Marie Kitts, and many years ago when I was first dean of St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute, and she was finishing her work at Johns Hopkins, I hired her to teach a course for uh, I think just one semester, maybe a, a year, and then she moved on to, to other places. 
So it's good to be here and to make those connections and grateful to the Kitts family for what they've made possible for you and, and, and for you, plural, and, and for me. But also, uh, I would be remiss not to say a thank you to Melinda Donovan. Where are you, Melinda? Yes, who has been wonderful to work with. And uh, thank you for all your help in coordinating, coordinating this event. Yeah. One more kind of announcement about my connections. Father James Kahn, who's a member of the Faculty of School of, the School of Theology and Ministry, was my colleague, co-teacher, and co-dean for a while at St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore. So I'm glad to be in her, his turf for a while. As you've heard, I come from a, a different but not dissimilar background to Boston College and Boston uh, College School of Theology and Ministry. St. Mary's Seminary and University is the first Roman Catholic seminary in the United States and the only one in the world that we know of at least that has a graduate ecumenical division that actually offers degrees. And it's been my privilege to be part of that institution, that is St. Mary's, for a short part of its history, 28 years now, uh, and St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute for more than half of its history. So while the School of Theology and Ministry is celebrating 10 years, we're also celebrating an anniversary this year, 50 years. 50 years, right after the Second Vatican Council, when the windows were opened, and uh, because of the work of great biblical scholars, Catholic, Protestant, and other in the Baltimore area, the St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute was founded and opened its doors in 1968. So this has been our jubilee year. And I'm honored to be here during that. Yeah. yeah it's as, as Father Stegman mentioned, I've been doing other things besides deaning for quite some time, the last uh, almost seven years now. And I was back with my wife, Nancy, who's here with us, uh, back to the North Shore yesterday and this morning. And I remembered being on the campus just for a little bit of uh, Gordon College, where I graduated from, and Gordon Con Conwell Theological Seminary, where I first got the itch in the library to do what I'm doing today. I remembered as we drove by the small uh, congregational church that I served for a couple of years as youth minister, that I read my first ever biblical commentary in the, in the office of that church when I was a sophomore in college. And it was the commentary on John by Raymond Brown. Now I uh, have, have his chair, and I'm happy to sit where he would have sat. So it's kind of an interesting kind of circle of life, so to speak. So anyhow, with those few introductory comments, let me get started on why you're here tonight, not to hear my personal story, but hopefully to hear a little bit about images of Christian unity in the New Testament. One of my best friends at Princeton Seminary, who's now a professor of theology and a dean at um, a Protestant Christian University, says this about himself, exemplifying the heart and promise of Christian unity. He says, I've been privileged to be trained by Jesuits, he went to St. Louis uh, for his PhD, raised by holiness folk, theologically shaped by Presbyterians at Princeton, captivated and honed by Anglicans, and deeply immersed and informed by the Wesleyan tradition. But my heart and my spirit are Benedictine. He spends a lot of time at St. Meinrad's uh, in his, and takes classes there. He so thankfully says for my many friends at places like St. Meinrad and St. John's. We live in a time of deep division, don't we? Politically, economically, socially, and even ecclesially. And so the idea of Christian unity might be a, a little bit of a hard sell at the moment. We might prefer Christian disunity or perhaps acknowledge Christian disunity. But I, I would like to suggest some images of Christian unity that might help us not only think more about it, but do more about it. And I've used the word images rather than passages for two reasons. First of all, I think word pictures can be more interesting than simply words. And secondly, uh, a colleague of mine at another uh, institution some years ago wrote a book called Picturing Christian Witness, New Testament Images of Disciples in Mission. And I like that language, picturing witness, New Testament images. 
So that's what I've decided to do this evening, and we'll present these images some longer than others. I'll warn you ahead of time, the first image will be the longest, so you're not going to be here for three hours, just so you know. Uh, more briefly on the other images, and then at the end I'll make some concluding theological remarks and open it up for some questions and answers. Now I'm using seven images tonight. There is a handout. I don't know if that made it around or not. Yeah. I'm using seven, seven images tonight, not because my lecture is perfect, but because that's the perfect biblical number. And um, I'm going to talk about those images not just analytically, or as we say in the Guild, exegetically, but also canonically, that is letting them talk to one another a little bit, and also theologically, reflecting on their significance for us as we are the church today. So first of all, some preliminary points from uh, before we look at the seven images. First of all, keep in mind that the idea of, of um, unity and disunity is already prevalent in the scriptures of Israel in the Old Testament in Father uh, Richard Clifford's field. Psalm 133, for instance, reads, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together as one. Now that's very good, but as my friend and fellow, fellow biblical scholar Steve Fowle says, that's not the whole story. Other Old Testament texts lead us to view, he says, Israel's division into northern and southern kingdoms as one of the results of Israel's pers persistent resistance to the, God, to the spirit of God. Division, he says, is simply one manifestation of this resistance, along with such things as grumbling against God and Moses in the wilderness, lapses into idolatry, um, requests for a human king, and so forth. Interestingly, Fowl suggests, each of these manifestations of resistance becomes a form of divine judgment, God giving us what we want. And he continues, if we treat division in this light, looking ahead to the New Testament and to the Christian church, it becomes clear that division is both a sign that we are willing to live and even may desire to live separate from our brothers and sisters in Christ. This separation in the form of church division, Fowl says, is God's judgment on our failure to love as Christ commands. He also says, such resistance further dulls our senses so that we are less able to discern the movements and promptings of God's spirit. Very important things to consider. But keep in mind also that in spite of all that, the prophets envisioned a day when the broken and scattered people of God would be reunited and restored as one. A prelude, as one other scholar puts it, to the influx of the nations into the one people of God. In other words, Christian unity is not a footnote to other more important things. It's at the heart of scripture, not only the heart of the New Testament, but the heart of the entire canon. Now the New Testament itself is an example of Christian unity, but also perhaps unity in diversity. The Apostle Paul writes Donald Sr., a prominent New Testament scholar in the Catholic tradition. The Apostle Paul spoke of the church as having many gifts, but one spirit, and as being one body with many members. The same, he says, might be said of the Bible, or specifically of either testament. One book with many parts and dimensions. Last year's lecturer here, Frank Matera, a good friend of mine, has written an important book on the subject with respect to the New Testament. That's why I ordered it on the back table. New Testament Theology, Exploring Diversity and Unity. And the great Protestant theologian and biblical scholar Jimmy Dunn, uh, James D.D. Dunn, wrote a similar book many years ago, Unity and Diversity in the New Testament. In other words, Matthew is not Mark, Luke is not John, Paul is not James, Galatians is not 1 Corinthians. We all know that, but sometimes we merge them and blur them. We especially do that, don't we, at Christmas time. We have Christmas pageants where Luke and Matthew's versions of the gospel all get blended into one, which is probably fine, but then we forget that the shepherds are only in Luke, the wise men or the wise kings or whatever we're going to call them are only in Matthew, and there's reasons for that when we read Luke and Matthew separately. 
Now, Christian unity is a wide-ranging topic with many different possible interpretations and approaches. The range can be from local to global, from two individuals on a mission team to a church staff to a single community or church to the whole global church and churches, diverse churches within a denomination, bilateral dialogues between, say, Catholics and Lutherans or Catholics and Pentecostals, lots of other things in between. And in terms of interpretation, I like to say that ecumenism or Christian unity is often in the eye of the beholder. For some people, it means getting along together or working together on common projects. Sometimes it means visible um, um, institutional unity and everything in between. But the New Testament images I'd like to talk with you about for a while uh, have some of those things in mind and perhaps other things as well that can stimulate, hopefully, our imaginations. So then without further ado to image number one. I'm calling this image as it is on your handout, one in God's life and love, John 17, some verses from John 17. Now all of you will probably recognize right away that this image is not from John 17. It's actually from John 13. I'll explain why in a few minutes. As I said, this will be the longest of the seven that I, that I talk about. So we begin with the Gospel of John and a very important text in Christian unity discussions. I, Jesus, that is, pray not only for them, the disciples who are present with him, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may, be, may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be brought to perfection as one, that the world may know that you sent me and that you loved them even as you loved me. These famous words found in the title of my lecture and often quoted in ecumenical dialogue circles and in Catholic documents like uh, St. Paul, John Paul II's encyclical Ut Unum Sint on commitment to ecumenism are part of Jesus' final prayer with his disciples. He pours out his heart to the Father praying for himself his immediate disciples, and all future disciples in the whole chapter, including, therefore, us. When he prays, he prays for us, and he prays three times for unity. He could hardly be more emphatic. We see here in this passage that unity, and this is two important words for my talk tonight, is derivative and it is participatory. Derivative and participatory. It is sharing in the eternal, unified, mutually loving life of the triune God. As Francis Maloney puts it, the purpose of God, according to John, is that we might be swept up into the life and love of God. Our unity with one another depends on, is the fruit of, derives from our unity with the Father and the Son. Christian unity, therefore, demands a robust Trinitarian spirituality. And an important corollary of this is disunity is effectively a denial of the unity that we have with the Father, Son, and Spirit and with one another. That is, it's a denial of the reality that we already participate in this unity of the triune God. To live in God, then, is to live in love, as Jesus implies here and states in John 15, to which we'll return in a little while, but for now, abide in me, Jesus says, abide in my love. Therefore, unity is a gift or a grace as well as a task. And I would say the gift and the grace actually come first. Jesus also said in John 15, without me or apart from me, you can do nothing. That includes achieving Christian unity. We also see in this text that unity is purposive. It has a goal. It is missional. Twice Jesus says this in verses 21 and 23 on the screen with the words, so that. And just before our text, which I didn't read, he has said, as you sent me, you father sent me into the world, so I sent them, the disciples, into the world. 
Marianne May Thompson, a Protestant Johannine scholar, says this, the disciples' unity with one another and with the Father and the Son is intended to bring the world to know that the Father sent Jesus. That is its purpose, though not always its result. The disciples participate in Jesus' mission, embodying God's love in order to bring life to the world, regardless of the world's response. Regardless of the response, says Marianne. Now, the phrase that the world may know does not merely mean so that others may know something about the disciples or even that it might know something about God. This is not an intellectual kind of knowing, but a relational kind of knowing that they too will be drawn into that life and love of God. When I was in seminary in Princeton, I had a very well-known missiologist named Samuel Moffat as a teacher. And he often said that the missionary movement went astray when it neglected ecumenism and the ecumenical movement went astray when it, when it neglected uh, mission. Let me say that again. The missionary movement went astray when it neglected ecumenism and the ecumenical movement went astray when it neglected mission. Christian unity and Christian mission should not be separated. When they are, each suffers. Another thought about the corollary I mentioned a minute ago. If Christian unity is a positive witness, then what is Christian disunity? Quite obviously, it's a negative witness. It's still a witness, but it's a negative witness, something that impedes the spread of the gospel and the gospel of the kingdom. The love into which we are drawn and to which we are called to bear witness is the self-giving love of the triune God, which is seen most clearly in Jesus' death on the cross. He says it's by that cross that all will be drawn to him. This love is represented in a living parable, the foot washing scene, which is in John 13. That's why I started there. That foot washing is the fundamental mode of existence for those who are Jesus' disciples. Now, my Nigerian friend here that I met before the lecture said, make sure in your lecture you use the word you're most famous for, which is the word cruciform. Simply means cross-shaped. All right, here's here's that promise being kept. Foot washing is an act of cruciform or cross-shaped, self-emptying and self-humbling. John 13 is, in fact, connected, in my view, to Paul's famous poem about Christ's self-emptying and self-humbling in Philippians 2, to which we shall return later. The point is this. Unity requires love, and love requires humility. Unity is impossible without humility, and therefore without love. Now, the picture you see in front of you is called the Divine Mercy Statue, at Harding University. It sits outside the chapel of Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas. It's a Churches of Christ institution. You may not even heard of Churches of Christ in the north. They're mostly in the south. Um, But it's a, a part of the Christian community, obviously. And I was so taken by this statue that when I left, and I told the people there when I left, they gave us a a model of it. It now sits in our home, which is very lovely. So this is Jesus washing the feet of a disciple. It is taking place uh, at the same context as John 17, our text. And foot washing, if you read John 13 carefully, is actually a missional practice, not just a practice for washing one another's feet, but for washing feet outside of the Christian community. You see, in John's gospel, Jesus is the one sent by the Father, the sent one. And after he instructs his disciples to wash one another's feet, he says, Amen, amen, I say to you, no slave is greater than his master, nor any messenger greater than the one who sent him. The word messenger is the word in Greek, apostolos. It's the only occurrence of that word in the Gospel of John. It means sent one. We get the word apostle from it, right? You see, Jesus' disciples are sent ones of the sent one. 
A few verses later in John 13, Jesus says, Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever receives the one I, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Participation in the life of God, discipleship to Jesus, involves mission and unity. In fact, shared mission, and you may have experienced this, shared mission draws people more deeply together and into the life and mission of God, into the unity of the Trinity that we saw in John 17. We find something similar in John 15. This is an image of the vine and the branches from John 15. And it is an image produced by someone who's here in the audience. Sharon, can you raise your hand? Sharon, where are you? Sharon's over there. She's a, a graduate of some years ago of Weston Jesuit School of Theology. And she sent this to me a couple of nights ago. And I thought, wow, can I get this into the slide presentation? And I did, thanks to Melinda's quick handling of things. So thank you so much for providing that. It's a lovely image. And she gave me permission to, to put it up here. In John 15, we learn about Jesus as the vine and, and we as the branches. By this, he says, is my father glorified that you bear much fruit and become, become my disciples. Isn't that interesting? Some translations say, prove to be my disciples. I think that's the wrong translation. We become disciples by virtue of that participating in the vine life and mission of Jesus. Some of you probably know, in, later in that chapter, Jesus once again links it to community when, say, when he says, love one another. So it's not an either or. Love the world or love disciples. It's, it's a both and. I like to say to my seminarians, you know by now I'm, I'm a Methodist. I'm a, I'm a so-called Protestant, although I'm not protesting anything. And I'm happy to be here, not under protest. But I often say to my seminarians, that's a great Catholic answer, both and, right? We think either or and Catholics come to the rescue and tell us it's both and. All right, I promise you that's the longest exposition of the night, but I think that's the most, one of the most important images of foot washing and vine and being in the Father and the Son together that I wanted to spend a bit of time on that. Some of you also probably know, just in conclusion, the song, they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, remember that? Especially if you're our age, we learned it in the 60s, sang it at the folk mass or the folk service or the contemporary service or whatever. Um, and they'll know we are Christians by our doctrine, by our doctrine. They'll, oh, no, it doesn't say that, does it? <laughs> they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Not that I have anything against doctrine, but that's not what the song says. All right, the second image, salt and light. Matthew 5, 13 to 16, famous words of Jesus about being salt and light. <clears throat> you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so your light might shine, must shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. Salt and light have this in common. What makes them effective is their being distinct from the environment in which they are located. Now it's important in reading this that we remember that in the Greek text, the you in this is you plural. You singular are not the salt of the earth or the light of the world, but as they might say in Arkansas where we just were, y'all are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. How do you do that in Massachusetts? Do you have a way? No. All right, you need to move south or go to Jersey. Yeah, you uh, use guys. Or if you're really serious, all, um, all use guys, I think they say. Pittsburgh has uh, uins or yins. You need to work on that. You know, Pak the Khan, Havad Yah is fine, but you need to get this plural, you. That's very important. Almost all the yous in the New Testament, not all, but a lot of them are plural. It's about the disciples as a community. Now, just before these images, we have the Beatitudes, a unified body with a consistent B 
the attitudinal character is what makes y'all the disciples of Jesus as salt and light. We cannot pick and choose which beatitudes to live by. They're a unit. They come together. Failing to embody the beatitudes together, together, means we lose our saltiness and hide our light. Instead, we argue and fight over which beatitudes to embody. One faction says, we'll be the peacemakers. Another says, we'll show mercy to the unborn. By the way, the first book I ever wrote wrote was a book called Abortion and the Early Church. It was my first ecumenical endeavor. I published it many, many years ago, and it was co-published by a Protestant press, InterVarsity, and a Catholic press, Paulist. And uh, that's uh, very important to me. Now it's reprinted by a kind of non, neither of those presses. But uh, if you're interested, it's still available. You you might want to read that book. Um, Yet another group says, well, we'll support women. And another, we'll welcome refugees. And in the Catholic context, one says, we're going to have charismatic prayer. And the other says, we're going to support the Knights of Columbus. There's these ecclesial divisions. Are the Beatitudes like a buffet lunch? No. As Paul would say, is Christ divided? As he would also say, may it never be. Note again with salt and light, unity is both missional and participatory. Salt in antiquity had a mission to flavor and preserve. It still has that kind of mission. Light too has a mission, drawing on the Old Testament text from Isaiah, for Israel to be the light to the nations or the Gentiles that's taken up by Jesus where he says, I'm the light of the world. So therefore, our being the light of the world is not only missional, but it's, it's uh, derivative. We are the light of the world because Jesus is the light of the world. So we're reading these, excuse me, we're reading these texts canonically in conversation, in context. Moreover, reading this word about salt in connection with John's gospel might help us understand the word about salt in Mark's gospel, which perplexes many New Testament scholars. Mark has Jesus' words as this, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt becomes insipid, with what will you restore its flavor? And he says, keep salt in yourselves and you will have peace with one another. And everybody says, huh? Well, it makes sense. If you want to be the salty, um, beatitudinal people of God, you need to also, to have mission, be united together. So the mission and the unity come together there as well. As in John 13, 15, and 17, holiness, unity, and mission once again come together. I had the text and forgot to show you. I apologize. Number three. A menagerie. Profane creatures made clean. Acts 10, uh, part of Acts 10, recounts Peter's vision that inspired some very important uh, dimensions and directions in the early church. The next day, Luke says, while they were on their way and nearing the city, Peter went up to the roof terrace to pray at about noontime. He was hungry and wished to eat. And while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. If you're hungry at noontime on a rooftop in Palestine, you probably might fall into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something resembling a large sheet coming down, lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all the earths, all the earths, four-legged animals and reptiles and the birds of the sky. A voice said to him, get up, Peter, slaughter and eat. But Peter said, certainly not, sir, or perhaps Lord, for never have I eaten anything profane and unclean. The voice spoke to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you are not to call profane. This happened three times, and then the object was taken up into the sky. Once again, hear the emphasis three times. We hear in this story, which, of which there's obviously a preface and a, and a postlude, Luke tells us that Peter is in doubt about the meaning of the vision. That's the 
tame NAB translation, the NRSV says he was greatly puzzled. That's in verse 17, which follows this. Beverly Gaventa, however, tells us what the vision means. She says, you can have anything you want for lunch, Peter. That's right. Peter probably thinks that the clean animals have been polluted by the unclean and he will therefore need to fast. Note that Peter both has a vision and an audition, something he hears. And we know from this way the story is told that God is the source of these things. God is showing and making a point three times. To make a long story short, Peter meets a Gentile named Cornelius, whom God had arranged, according to Luke, to meet Peter. When they meet, Peter learns the meaning of his dream. You know that it's unlawful for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call any person profane or unclean. Peter then preaches, right after that, the gospel of God's peace and impartiality, saying, everyone who believes in the risen Jesus will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles. What is happening here in one way is the opposite of what we see in John 17. There, unity led to mission. Here, mission leads to unity. More specifically, Peter is learning that God's mission in which he's been involved literally from day one, Pentecost, is much more expansive and boundary-breaking than he had imagined. The church, to return to the vision, is to be an unexpected assembly of various kinds of animals, a menagerie, if you will, of supposedly clean and unclean. Most obviously, for Peter and the earliest Christians, this means that the church of Jesus Christ is for Gentiles as well as Jews equals at the table, the fellowship table. Thus, mission has created unity, which will in turn require and compel the apostles to engage in still greater and more expansive mission. This conviction about Jewish and Gentile unity in Christ compels much of the New Testament, but most especially the letters of Paul and most particularly Galatians and Romans. You see, whereas humans create binaries, Gentile and Jew, slave and free, male and female, black and white, American and Mexican, Western and Middle Eastern, so forth and so on, documented and undocumented, not to get political, but to get political, uh, God in Christ creates unity without denying difference. For fallen humanity, we want to eat with those who are similar in color and origin but God in Christ is bringing the binaries together. That leads to image number four. The broken wall, a holy temple. We now consider a passage from the letter to the Ephesians. I'm going to refer to the author as Paul because I think Paul is the author. But that's a different discussion for a different day. Just as human beings like to construct binaries, we like to construct walls. Ghettos in Poland, the Berlin Wall, the wall in Israel slash Palestine, the US-Mexico border. But in Jesus Christ, God has torn down walls. Perhaps the most potent symbol, or symbolic wall, I should say, known to early Jews and Christians was the wall of Jerusalem that separated the court of the Gentiles from the inner temple precincts. Gentiles entered that area on pain of death, as the inscription in the lower right-hand corner of the screen shows you, an inscription which is still exi in existence today and can be found in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. I've seen it numerous times. Here's the text from Ephesians. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll let you uh, read parts of it. But just the beginning. He, Christ, is our peace. He who made both one and broke down the dividing wall of enmity through his flesh, that he might create in himself one new person in place of the two, thus establishing peace. 
and might reconcile both with God in one body through the cross. As Professor Fem Perkins, known well here in BC, points out clearly in her NIB commentary on Ephesians, several Second Temple Jewish texts depict the law as a wall to safeguard the Jewish people from Gentiles. Similarly, in Ephesians, the temple wall, the literal temple wall, keeps keeping Gentiles out, is symbolic of the law as a hedge, a border, to keep Jews safe from unholy Gentiles. But in Christ, Ephesians says, the wall and every human-made wall has been torn down. Christ's death is the act of peacemaking that reconciles us not only to God, vertically, if you will, but also to one another, horizontally, to use spatial imagery. As Nostra Aetate said in the Second Vatican Council documents, quote, the church believes that by his cross, Christ, our peace, reconciled Jews and Gentiles, making both one in himself. Once again, for the early church, the great division was between Jews and Gentiles. But the mission of God, Paul tells us, is not limited to that. It is a mission of wall deconstruction. The divine mission is greater than our human imagination, greater than anything we might ask or imagine, to allude to Ephesians 3, the next chapter after chapter 2. As in Acts 10, mission leads to unity, which again should lead to greater and more expansive mission. We have our own divisions today, but God is still in the deconstruction and recon reconciliation business. As 2 Corinthians puts it, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Or as Pope Francis has said just recently, quoted in America Magazine, those who build walls end up being prisoners of the walls they have built. On the other hand, those who build bridges go forward. And then he famously has said, of course, Christians are those who build bridges, not walls. The church cannot fully be God's one holy temple until the walls of separation we build come tumbling down like the walls of Jericho or like the Berlin Wall. Fifth image, a cruciform colony of heaven. Our fifth image comes from another Pauline letter, this one to the Philippians. Only conduct yourselves, Paul writes, I'll come back to the words in brackets in a minute, in a way worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear news of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, struggling together for the faith of the gospel, not intimidated in any way by your opponents. And then a few verses later, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any solace and love, any participation in the spirit, any compassion and mercy, complete my joy by being of the same mind with the same love, united in heart, thinking one thing. Do nothing out of selfishness or out of vain glory. Rather, humbly regard others as more important than yourselves, each looking out not for his own interest, but also, oh, I shouldn't put that in brackets. Translations often say also uh, everyone for those interests of others. I think the word actually should be translated instead. So I got the bracket wrong there. So the instead part is my translation. In these verses, there are fewer, no fewer than seven expressions of Christian unity. Standing firm in one spirit, one mind, struggling together, being of the same mind, same love, united in heart, thinking one thing. The perfect biblical number, right? Seven. This plea for Christian unity through humility and mutual service is, once again, as in John and Matthew and Acts, connected to the church's witness to the world. Here it says, and now I'm quoting from myself, the bracketed in verse 27, Conduct your common life as God's colony in the public square of Rome's colony. You see, Philippi was a Roman colony, but the language that Paul uses here is about being an alternative colony, an alternative polis, P-O-L-I-S, where we get the word Annapolis, for instance, where we live, near where we live. 
In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven, which means that it's not in Rome, because the church is a colony of another emperor and, and his empire. The study notes in the New American Bible uh, translation make this crystal clear, commenting on Philippians 3.20. The notes say, Christians constitute a colony of heaven as Philippi was a colonia of Rome. Now I mentioned the word mission. Back to chapter 2, a little bit later, Paul says to the Philippians, do everything without grumbling or questioning so that you may shine like lights in the world. Another reference to the light of the world imagery from Isaiah and from the gospel tradition. So that as you hold on to or hold forth the word of life, uh, you may be, I, I may boast of you in the day of Christ. So the, before this very, so these two things I've quoted, this comes before a famous poem of, of Christ. These words I just quoted uh, about being shining lights in the world come after the poem. On either side of this poem about Jesus, which we're going to look at briefly in a moment, Paul talks about mission within the community and then afterward about mission outside of the community. Missiologists refer to this as centripetal and centrifugal mission, inner and outer, internal and external, if you will. And it's, it's really interesting that Paul holds them both together. And they, they bracket their bookending a famous poem or song about Jesus that's found in Philippians chapter 2. This is my translation, not the NAB. It says, Philippians says, to cultivate this mindset, this way of thinking, feeling, and acting within your community, which is a community in the Messiah Jesus, <coughs> pardon me, who although and because he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name. The first few verses here, especially verses 6 to 8, help us understand what Paul means in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Once again, then, Christ's life is the basis of Christian life, or to say it differently, life in Christ is derivative, uh, life rather as Christian community is derivative of life in Christ. And therefore our mission is once again participatory and derivative. To put it a little bit differently and to explain what I mean by the word cruciform, the cross is not merely the source of our life, but the or the source of our salvation, but also the shape of our salvation. And interestingly, the ultimate Pauline paradox, and maybe Father Matera spoke about this last year, I'm not sure, is that Christ crucified is the ultimate expression of life, especially the life of God. So I refer to that as resurrectional cruciformity, the life-giving cross-shaped life of the community. One last point here. It's also, once again, God who does the empowering for this unity and witness to occur. 128 says, this is God's doing. And 213 says, for God is the one who, for his good purpose, works in you, that is in y'all, both to desire and to work. Sixth image one body with many members. Along with John 17, this is perhaps the most famous image of Christian unity in the New Testament. I'll read just a bit of it. As a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many are one body, so also Christ. If a, uh, verse 15, if a foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong, it is, does not for this reason become any less, belong any less to the body. If they were all one part, where would the body be? 
but as it are, there's many parts. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, nor again the head to the feet, I don't need you. Indeed, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary. Paul's letter, to, first letter to the Corinthians, is often known as a letter of Christian unity. Chapter 1, verse 10 actually says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you should be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. That said, however, 1 Corinthians is much more than a letter about unity. It's also a letter about, a letter about holiness. It's a letter about being apostolic. And it's a letter about being uh, united as one. From the outset of the letter, Ray Collins says, Paul asked the question not only about unity, but also how is the community one and how is the community distinct? How can it be one and how can it also be distinct? That is, now I'm paraphrasing Collins, the church has to be both one and holy. I think the Nicene Creed got it right when it said the church should be one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And I think we can find all four of those in the letter to the Corinthians. But tonight we're worried about unity. This portion of 1 Corinthians makes it clear that unity does not mean uniformity. In fact, uniformity is the, the antithesis of unity. Now, what's distinctive about Christian unity? In the ancient world, lots of people used the image of a body, and they, lots of people talked about interdependence in political bodies and other kinds of bodies. What makes this image distinctive is the very last verse. The weaker members of the body are all the more necessary and ought to be given the more um, important role and honor in the church. This radical character of Christian unity privileges the weak. It is, to use Catholic social teaching language, a preferential option for the poor. And this comes out most readily and most vividly in another image, which isn't exactly an image, but sort of is, uh, from 1 Corinthians, the image of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. In that text, Paul says, when you meet in one place, starting in the middle, verse 20, when you meet in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own supper and one goes hungry while another gets drunk. Do you not have houses in which you can eat and drink? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and make those who have nothing feel ashamed? What can I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this matter, I do not praise you. Notice the line in verse 20. When you assemble, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. In other words, Jesus is both the host and the guest of the supper. In the ancient world, lots of gods said, come on down to my house. Well, they had people say it for them. Come on down to my house for a dinner. This is a, a sort of a version of that. But Jesus now is no longer the host or the guest when the, tr when the poor are mistreated. As we would expect, in other words, the Lord's Supper, which celebrates the, the death of our Lord, is necessarily a cross-shaped event. And when it's not, when it's not life-giving by being cross-shaped, it is no longer the Lord's Supper. It's no longer holy communion. I wish I had time to talk about the theology of the Lord's Supper because that's the one practice where there's more disunity in the Christian churches than there is unity. Now, if I were Baptist, I'd say, can I get an amen? But um, I'm Methodist, so we neither say nor ask for amen. But can I get an amen? amen. Okay. Uh, or we could sing one bread, one body. Beautiful. Fortunately, that's in many hymnals, including even our Methodist hymnal. All right. Last image. Oh, I forgot. I've got the words there. One bread. If we had time. 
The last image is from the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, closes out the New Testament and the entire canon. It's an image of a multitude from every nation. After this, I had a vision of a great multitude, which no one could count from every single nation, race, people, and tongue. They stood before the throne of God and before the Lamb, wearing white robes, holding palm branches in their hands, crying out, salvation comes from our God who's seated on the throne and from the Lamb. In the Catholic Church and many other churches, this is part of the reading for All Saints Day or All Saints Sunday. It is perhaps my favorite image of Christian unity in the New Testament. Paul speaks of a similar reality without the great poetry and lyricism of Revelation in Romans 15, a vision of different peoples united in, in the very thing we as humans were created to do to worship God. This, I think, is the original ecumenical vision because the word ecumenical comes from the Greek word oikumene, which means the entire inhabited world. It means for Christian, the end of every, Christians the end of every form of tribalism and nationalism. These kinds of isms are always a temptation for us, but at certain times those temptations are more virulent than others and must be resisted more forcefully. The whole church celebrates and worships the one true God and the lamb that was slain, but is now resurrected and standing. The church in the United States is facing an enormous challenge right now, but also an amazing opportunity to become across the country a truly intercultural church, to develop a vision for the age of migration. And I'm alluding there not just to what's obvious, but also to a title of a new book, called Intercultural Church, A Biblical Vision for the Age of Migration. So to conclude, Christian unity in the New Testament, some theological reflections very briefly, and then we'll open it up for some dialogue and Q&A. First of all, I've suggested to you that Christian unity is both a gift and a task. My friend, Brother Roger, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was going to quote my friend. Brother Roger is deceased. Uh, I have a brother, a friend, Brother John at Teze, but I'm going to quote Brother Roger, the founder. My apologies. As Brother Roger of Teze said, in my youth, I was astonished to see how Christians who nevertheless live, live from a God of love use so much energy to justify their separation. So his task, as he saw it, was, quote, to render visible a little parable of communion. And that's the Teze community in Teze, France. Two, Christian unity is both participatory and derivative, grounded in communion with the triune God. Three, Christian unity is a missional unity. It is both centripetally or internally and centrifugally missional. Four, Christian unity is, unif is, is cruciform. No, that's not four, is it? Number four, Christian unity is not uniformity, but unity in diversity. Five, Christian unity is cruciform. Six, Christian unity is bi binary breaking and boundary breaking. Seven, Christian unity is not a silo. It's only works in connection when it, with the other marks of the church, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Now for an eighth point. I didn't think I was gonna be able to explain what I'm going to say now, but I was given the perfect analogy when I drove into the campus and realized that Boston College is a university, but it's not a university, it's a college, but it can't be a college because it's a university. So bear with me for a moment while I say some things that sound like I'm getting all confused or you're getting all confused because I've hit my 50 minute mark. But if Christians are agreed that Christian unity is critical, what's preventing it? Three suggestions. On the one hand, I would suggest that we face the same sorts of problems that the Roman churches faced according to Romans 14 and 15. 
we know that we should, be not, we should not be separated by matters that don't matter. The problem is we can't always decide which matters don't matter. So I'm using college, university, matter, matter. Okay, second point. On the other hand, sometimes we actually think we know which matters matter, but they are actually matters that don't matter. Or they don't matter as much as we think they matter. So we make matters that don't matter into matters that do matter or matter more than they should. But once again, we can't agree which matters don't matter that we make into matters that allegedly do matter. You with me? All right. Third confusing point. I should have stopped while I was ahead with the seven, right? But the eighth day of creation, the eighth day of the lecture. On yet another hand, if that's possible, we sometimes actually disagree about matters that do matter, and we need to keep working on them. Thank you very much. You're welcome to raise a question about what you were talking about in your, in your little discussions there. But otherwise, the floor is open for feedback, questions about something I said, clarification, discussion. Um, I'll say this as the sort of um, uh, speaker slash uh, um, moderator as well. I think we want mostly questions and not speeches. Uh, and remember, you will be on, on the internet for the rest of your life and longer probably, so, <laughs> as uh, I said at the beginning. So uh, raise your hand if you could, please. There's one or two roving mics. All right, way back in the back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joe Cabadas. I'm a veteran for peace. Okay. And uh, we had a um, Daniel Berrigan and Phil Berrigan uh, in the theology, basement of the theology uh, library, there was a big uh, exhibit there. Oh. And um, I think the key to uniting the Christian religion in this country today is the eight, end the war in Afghanistan that's been going on for 18 years. The po three, we had three popes condemn it, and we don't hear anything from the uh, Catholic bishops. The Quakers, I've been out protesting the war for 17 years. We have Quakers, we have uh, Universalist Union people, a few Catholics, and I'm a member of Pax Christi, and we're down to four people who go to a meeting. Can That's you? where the unity of Christianity could start by ending these wars in Afghanistan. It's Thank an you. interesting comment. Do you want to add a question to that or just make the comment? Do you, want, do you want a response or? Well, you, you made a comment, but oh, you, yeah. you didn't ask for a response on my part. If you, is that? Oh, yeah. OK. Uh, well, um, that's a good question. Uh, I share many of the uh, values and perspectives you just shared with the group. Uh, I'm not sure I would go so far as to say that that's going to uh, bring an end to Christian division, but it's certainly a part of uh, the Christian vision that has sometimes separated and sometimes united uh, people, so uh, Christians. So I would certainly agree with you that that's an important part of Christian witness. And the disunity on that certainly, from my point of view, uh, has a negative effect on not only our internal life, but also our exter external witness. That would, uh, to, to go into much more uh, detail about that would probably take us a little bit off, off topic, but let me simply say that one of the things that I've been a, a, a pretty serious advocate of for a long time is the necessity for a holistic view of Christian ethics and of Christian responsibility, which is kind of why I said we have the peacemakers and the, and the anti-abortion folks sometimes at odds with one another, and I think we ought to be on the same page. As many of you know, Colonel, Bern Colonel Bernadine many years ago used the language of a consistent ethic of life for a variety of reasons. Some people are uncomfortable with that language, feeling like it was perhaps overused by one side or one group rather than the other. But uh, to quote my good friend Richard Hayes um, in his book, The Moral Vision of the New Testament, a very important book uh, voted by Christianity Today, one of the top 100 books, uh, Christian books of theology of the 20th century. Richard Hayes says in that book, there's not a single syllable of support for 
Christians engaging in violence in the New Testament, and he would include both uh, the violence of warfare and the violence of abortion, uh, among many other things within that. And I think Protestants and Catholics alike need to be in more dialogue about that for sure. So thank you for sharing your point of view. Yeah. Yes, we have a question here, a comment here. Wait, wait for the microphone, please. I love your term, cruciform. Okay. I think it's fabulous. Thank you. Could you expound upon your um, de definition of your term? Sure. Um, the, the word cruciform originally meant literally a cross-shaped, it was used for, to uh, describe a cross-shaped building, specifically a cathedral. So if you go into a cathedral, especially a European cathedral, you know, you've got, it looks, it looks like this. And you have the rose windows on the east and the west, sorry, north and south transepts, and then uh, the longitudinal, the cross. So cruciform uh, cross shape became a word that was used in a few circles, very few circles, um, in the 16th century, and it it didn't really resonate, uh, didn't stick. Was revived by a few different circles in the 20th century. And I was writing uh, some, uh, doing some writing on Paul about 20 years ago, and I was looking for a word to describe cross-shaped. And I said, hey, how about cruciform? Cross-shaped living, living that resembles what Jesus did on the cross. That is, he gave himself in love. Rather than, look, rather than looking out for his own interests, he looked out for the interests of others. And that's what I uh, meant. So I thought I had, I had invented this word, cruciformity. I knew I hadn't invented the adjective, but I used this noun, cruciformity. And then I discovered that other people had actually used it. A few other people had used it prior. But that's the basic idea. So um, some people think it means suffering, but it doesn't mean suffering necessarily. It, it can lead to suffering. But when, um, when we... Instead of uh, exploiting our particular gifts or status or role for ourselves, but rather use that for the good of others, as Jesus did, who had the status of, of God, the form of God, gave that up and became human. Um, uh, and then, in, after the incarnation, gave it up more fully, um, not only denied himself by becoming human, but became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So from the highest to the lowest, to give that kind of um, life-giving love to others and concern for others. And this idea runs throughout the New Testament. Jesus said, it's another way of say, Jay, saying, take up my cross and follow me. It's different language for a similar, a similar idea. Lots more that could be said about that. By the way, I have had some feminist... Um, some feminists have pushed back, uh, pushed back against that idea, feminist theologians and so forth. But some feminist theologians have embraced it, particularly when it comes to notions of power, that we have to understand that power is always power for rather than power over. And so it, it, it's very, I think, been a significant concept and developed by others, not just by me for sure. Great question. Thank you. I'm going to move around a little bit, if you don't mind. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have two questions. One is, all of these images are lovely. I'm just surprised you didn't talk about the image of baptism in the New Testament as foundational for Christian unity and also the role of the Holy Spirit. My second question would be, how do you think these scriptural images could be used liturgically to promote ecumenism today? Great question. The first one is, Melinda told me I had 50 minutes Okay, so I couldn't do everything. Baptism could certainly be um, used. And uh, if I didn't mention the spirit, I implied the spirit when I used the language of the triune God. So, and I also said that God has to empower the mission, quoting Paul in Philippians, and the, the means, if you will, the person who's, uh, I'll get in trouble with my systematic theologian son here, the person of the Trinity who's most responsible for that divine activity, unified activity, is the Spirit. I think I escaped error there. Uh, so, but, but could go back to baptism. You know, we use the language of baptism, but the word baptize, that's religious language. Let's 
if we want to make it an image, let's change the image to immersion. The word baptize means to immerse. So we need to be immersed into the person in the story of Jesus so that we can, um, as Paul says, put on his clothing and take on. So that's a wonderful image. And if I had had more time and more lectures or whatever, we could certainly do that. So thanks for bringing that up. I don't want to ignore either one of those. Uh, but I, uh, so anyhow, that's enough about question number one. Question number two, how could we use these images both in the life of the church and also to further Christian um, unity? Uh, well, images are important to the Christian church. You know, in most churches, older churches in particular, there are stained glass windows. There are other forms of art and architecture. That's not simply to, to make pretty pictures. That was originated in order to allow people to understand and read the scriptures and the faith when they couldn't read words on a page or couldn't read many words on a page. So. I think we should use our church buildings better to uh, preach from, homilies or whatever, to teach from, to take confirmation classes around and say, here's what this image means, and to keep in mind that it's, if it is appropriate, it's an image about the unity of the church and the mission of the church. Um, it's also important, I think, to allow these scriptural images to fund our ecumenical vision. When we talk about baptism, for instance, do we say, don't forget, if you're baptized in the name of the triune God, you are considered a brother or sister, whether you're Catholic, Methodist, Presbyterian, you name it, and that's Catholic doctrine. That's not me speaking as a visiting scholar. That's Catholic doctrine. That's also ecumenical dialogue. So we can we can, in the, in the process of, of Christian formation, whether of youth or of adults, be more ecumenical than we are. And I'm not just putting the burden on, on Roman Catholics, but I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, there are people who walk into Protestant churches who think Catholics are not Christians. Funny story about that. My wife, as I said, used to be a French teacher, and she would sometimes, you know, cautiously around Easter or Christmas move into the realm of talking about the factual dimensions of religious observances. And sometimes a question would come up and kids would say things like, I'm not Christian, I'm Catholic. <laughs> By which they meant, I don't go to the non-denominational church here in town, I go to St. Joe's Catholic. You know, so there's that kind of, you know, I can't possibly be Christian because I'm Catholic. Well, there are people in some Protestant churches who say, yeah, you're right. And that's an... <laughs> That's an ecumenical problem. One of the wonderful things about my, um, sorry, I lose track of time when I get going on Q&A. Uh, one of the wonderful things about teaching at St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute for the last 28 years, we get everybody in our, in our classroom. And to see people come together and study theology together who come from all kinds of denominations, some of them may have walked in wondering, I'm not sure I should be in this Catholic place. Others have said, why am I in this, I'm in this Catholic place and why are they letting those Baptists in or those Lutherans in or you know, whatever. And to see people, those walls break down, those barriers break down and to have a really good meaningful exchange to agree to disagree, but also to agree to agree. Yeah, okay, I got into a speech mode there, apologize, homily mode or whatever. Yeah, please, I think there's a, let's get this gentleman up here if you don't mind. And then the woman in the back. Yeah, I think. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Um, Gorman. Um, do, you, do you think there's a dynamic to corporate suffering, which can be, or uh, it's a reality of corporate suffering, which can be um, dynamic and uh, powerful? To corporate suffering? Yeah, and, yes, and, br and, br and brings unity. Sure. Yeah. Um, the blood of the martyrs, the early fathers uh, said, is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is also one of the unifying factors in the church. And I think it's very important for us as, as Christians in this day and age to be aware of 
the suffering of Christians around the world, in the majority world, in um, certain, not all, but in certain uh, countries that are primarily Muslim, uh, certain countries in Asia. I'm sure many of you have heard about uh, the persecution of the churches in China. It, it, it's, you have to look hard, but it, once you start looking, you can get connected pretty easily. Um, all right. In Nigeria, yes, there have been uh, uh, kidnappings and murders and, and burnings of churches and of people. Yes, so uh, we have a Nigerian uh, here with us today. So this, is, this does not make the front page of the Washington Post or the, or the Boston Globe. Is that Boston Globe? Right. Um, it might be occasionally buried. More often than not, it's buried on around page 17 if it's there at all. You have to, this, so this is, this is something that, that does bring Christians together. So uh, unfortunately, sometimes martyrdom does and I don't mean just martyrdom, but suffering can bring, uh, can bring Christians together. I don't want to advocate that as the way to Christian unity, but it, as, a, as a de facto way, I think that that's true. And so you sometimes hear uh, well, let's say in Turkey, I've heard of, of um, evangelical Protestants being murdered and they received the expression of the local Catholic ordinary expression of, of, of sympathy for their, for their death and, and their witness. So yes, and in other ways, I'm sure too, uh, um, the suffering of, of, um, of poverty and of service to the poor, um, when people are hungry and you're feeding them in the food line, the first thing you don't ask them is, are you, are you Baptist or are you are Catholic? You know? And so there can be a kind of unity that emerges from that kind of ex experience as well. So I, there's probably wiser people in the room who could address that better. But in the interest of getting to at least one more question, I'll leave it there. There's the woman in the back had her hand up. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this. It was wonderful this evening. But there's a, um, oftentimes I hear people say, well, you're being, this is all about relativity, you know, relativism. Um, this, search for Christian unity. Doesn't matter who you are? Doesn't matter whether you're Methodist or doesn't matter whether you're Catholic? How do you respond to that? I mean, I know how we hear, but I mean, this, this is a, I hear it a lot. When you say people say that it's all relative, are, you, are they saying, are they simply saying it doesn't matter what you are? No, it's saying to someone who is proposing yeah. an ecumenical vision that, the, sure. um, that you're really giving up on your own understanding oh, of faith. Okay. And so this is, you know, so yeah. you're saying it doesn't really matter so long as it, you it, propose to be a Christian. Yeah, I mean, I, maybe this might, this might go to my point about gift and task. I'm not the first one who, have, who said what I said about John 17. I mean, you can read this in almost any Catholic document that even broaches the subject of ecumenical dialogue, relationships, Christian unity, which is to say, this is an unsustainable way for the church to be. Now, as I also said, to a degree, Christian unity is in the eye of the beholder. I can guarantee you that most Methodists, not all Methodists, don't think there should be visible unity with one titular head, namely the Pope. Most Methodists don't want to go down that road. But uh, I forget which pope it is who said uh, the primacy of Peter might be open for discussion. Who said that? Was it JP too? Sorry. Uh, that, that conversation may have been closed for a while. It may be reopened. But, and, and I'm not, you know, I, I'm in a Catholic house, so I'm not going to say anything too, <laughs> too, um, controversial about certain Catholic perspectives. But I think the discussion of the Eucharist needs to be more, uh, from the Catholic side, needs to be a little bit more open-minded than it normally is. Let me just put it that way. And I actually have had some Jesuits agree with me on that in conversations with people I won't name. I don't want to get them in trouble. <laughs> uh, 
So um, it has to be from both sides. And maybe in God's good future, there will be a time when we can agree on some of these things that we currently disagree with. Now, let me give you a great example, and this will have to be the conclusion, because Melinda also told me we could at 7 o'clock, and I never go over time. Well, my students would say I do go over time sometime, but try not to in a public lecture. In the 16th century, Protestants and Catholics excommunicated each other. They pronounced anathemas against one another. 500 years almost, 500 years. Those pronouncements were still in existence. It was 20 years ago this year that Lutherans and Catholics abolished those essential excommunications. That took five, well, almost 500 years. The Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, 1999, signed by most Lutherans, not all, most Catholics. Then it was signed on in in, um, uh, 2006 by the Methodist World Federation, and then a reform body basically signed on. And last, was it last summer or two summers ago? I forget. One of the Anglican big bodies more or less signed on to the degree that they sign on to anything because they're not signers. Um, I mean, you know, this is, this is amazing. It took a long time. I think the same thing could happen. Mary's easy. Protestants just have to get on board with a few things. Uh, Mary's easy. Pope's going to be harder. I'll rate these. What's left? There's five identified by the, by the larger body. There's five. Mary, Pope, justification. The justification is taken care of, according to Jeff Groh, at least. Oh, uh, orders and such. Uh, and Eucharist. Eucharist is going to be a tough one, but I think, I think if a few sides could give, we could get there. That, that'd be the next one I would work on if I were in charge. But I'm not in charge, and we're done. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gorman.